3. The first stage of the Civil War, November 1947 to March 1948. The war begins. David Sheltiel, the commander of the HIS, wrote on the night of the 29th of November, None of us knows what may happen tomorrow. For months, the Yishuv had vaguely expected war, but at some ill-defined point in our future. The prevalent view in the HIS was that the Arab states were disunited and the Arabs of Palestine unprepared. They would not go to war on the passage of the partition resolution. The night of the 29th to the 30th, November, passed in the Yishuv settlements in noisy public rejoicing. Most had sat glued to their radio sets broadcasting live from the Flushing Meadow. A collective cry of joy went up when the two-thirds mark was achieved. A state had been sanctioned by the international community. The young poured into the streets and danced and celebrated around bonfires through the night. In the National Institutions compound in Jerusalem, Golda Meyerson, or Meir, acting director at the GA political department, as Moshe Shertok was in New York, addressed the crowd from the balcony. For two thousand years we have waited for our deliverance. Now that it is here, it is so great and wonderful that it surpasses human words. Jews, Mazel Tov. In brackets, good luck. But some, like Yosef Nemani, a veteran of Hashomer and a Tiberius city councillor, were more sober. That night, the celebrants carried him aloft through the streets of the lakeside town, but in his diary he jotted down. In my heart there was joy mixed with sadness, joy that the peoples of the world had at last acknowledged that we were a nation with a state, and sadness that we lost half the country, Judea and Samaria, and in addition that we would have in our state 400,000 Arabs. Namani's friend from the second Aliyah, Ben Gurion, was also gloomy, but for another reason. I could not dance. I could not sing that night. I looked at them so happy dancing, and I could only think that they were all going to war. Not far from each celebrating throng was an Arab village or neighborhood. There the mood was grim. But the Palestinian Arab national movement, backed by the surrounding Arab societies and states, had for decades tried to stymie what Palestine's Arabs had most feared, and now come to pass. At 8.20 a.m. on the 30th of November, 1947, an eight-man Jaffa-based armed band led by Saif al-Din Abu Kish ambushed a Jewish bus in the coastal plain near Kafar, Syrikin, killing five and wounding others. Half an hour later, the gunman let loose at a second bus, southbound from Hadira, killing two more. Later that morning, Arab snipers began to fire from Jaffa's Manshia neighborhood into southern Tel Aviv, killing at least one person. These were the first dead of the 1948 war. Shots were also fired at Jewish buses in Jerusalem and Haifa. It is almost certain that the two fatal roadside ambushes were not ordered or organized by the AHC, and it remains unclear whether the gunmen were in fact reacting to the UN resolution. One HIS report says that the attacks were planned in a coffee shop in Yehuda, Yehudia, on the night of the 29th of November, after hearing the news from New York, but that the aim was robbery under cover of a response to the UN resolution. But the majority view in the HIS, supported by an anonymous Arab flyer posted almost immediately on the 
walls of Jaffa was that the attacks were driven primarily by a desire to avenge the LHI raid ten days before on a house near Rayana belonging to the Abu Kish Bedouin tribe. The raiders had selected five males of the Shubaki family and executed them in a nearby orange grove. The raiders believed, apparently mistakenly, that the Shubakas, a few days earlier, had informed the authorities about the LHI training session nearby. This had led to a British raid in which five Jewish youngsters were killed. Be that as it may, there was also a clear organized Palestinian Arab response to the UN resolution. Guided by Husseini from Cairo, the AHC on the 1st of December declared a three-day general strike in Palestine to begin the following day. On the 2nd of December, a large Arab mob armed with clubs and knives burst out of Jerusalem's old city and descended on the new commercial center at Mamilla Street, attacking Jewish passerbys and shops. A number of people were injured, one seriously, and the district was set alight. The mob then proceeded up Queen Mary Street and into Jaffa Street. Haganah Intelligence identified two AHC officials, Muhammad Ali Salah and Muhammad Umari, as leading the crowd. Small Haganah units fired above and into the mob, as mandate police and troops generally looked on. Indeed, several policemen joined in the vandalizing and looting, though others helped evacuate the Jewish wounded. The mob eventually turned back and dispersed, but the war had begun. Yet that day, and for the next few weeks, no one really understood this. For most, the uh, sporadic violence appeared to be just another wave akin to the Arab outbreaks of 1920, 1921, and 1929. It would pass. This view affected both sides. The Palestinian notable, Hikmat al Taji al Faruqi, told an HIS agent two months after the start of hostilities. When the business began, we did not expect it to begin. More accurately, we were not at all sure that it would develop and take on the dimensions of a war. So we armed ourselves with stones, sticks, rented rifles, and pistols. But the violence was gradually to snowball into full-scale war, in which Palestinian Arab society would be shattered and the Arab world traumatized and humiliated. The Civil War, 30th of November, 1947, to the 14th of May, 1948. The 1948 war, called by the Arab world the, the First Palestine War, and by the Palestinians al-Nakba, in brackets, the disaster, and by the Jews, the War of Independence. Milhamet ha atzma'ut, the War of Liberation. Milhamet hashirur, or the War of Establishment. Milhamet hako memiyot was to have two distinct stages, a civil war, beginning on the 30th of November, 1947, and ending on the 14th of May, 1948, and a conventional war, beginning when the armies of the surrounding Arab states invaded Palestine on the 15th of May, and ended in 1949. The civil, or ethnic, or intercommunal war between Palestine's Jewish and Arab communities, the latter assisted by a small army of volunteers, from the wider Arab world, was characterized by guerrilla warfare accompanied by acts of terrorism. The subsequent conventional war, which ended officially only in July 1949, but in fact stopped in terms of hostilities, the previous January, January saw the armies of Syria, Egypt, Transjordan, and Iraq with contingents from other Arab countries attacking the newborn state of Israel. 
and its army, the Haganah, which on the 1st of June, 1948, became the Israel Defense Forces. The Civil War can roughly be divided into two parts or stages, from the end of November 1947 until the end of March 1948. The Arabs held the initiative and the Haganah was on the strategic defense. This stage was characterized by gradually expanding continuous small-scale, small-unit fighting. There was terrorism and counter-terrorist strikes in the towns, ambushes along the roads. Arab armed bands attacked Jewish settlements and Haganah units occasionally retaliated. It was formless. There were no front lines, except along the seams between the two communities in the main mixed towns. No armies moving back and forth, no pitched battles, and no conquest of territory. Then, in early April, the Haganah went over to the offensive by mid-May, crushing the Palestinians. This second stage involved major campaigns and battles and resulted in the conquest of territory, mainly by the Jews. At its end emerged a clear, the clear at its end emerged <clears throat> excuse me at its end emerged clear front lines marking a continuous jewish held piece of territory with the areas beyond it under arab control in describing the first civil war half of the war it is necessary to take account of three important facts one, most of the fighting between November 1947 and mid-May 1948 occurred in the areas earmarked for Jewish statehood. The main exception between Jerusalem, earmarked for international control, and the largely Arab-populated corridor to it from Tel Aviv. And where the Jew Jews enjoyed demographic superiority, Almost no fighting occurred in the almost exclusive Arab-populated Central and Upper Galilee and Samaria, and the hosti hostilities in the hill country south of Jerusalem were confined to the small Etzian block enclave, enclave and the road to it. 2. The Jewish and Arab communities in western and northern Palestine were thoroughly intermingled. In the main cities and in some towns, Haifa, Jaffa, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Safad, Tiberias, the populations were mixed with Arabs, often sitting astride routes to the Jewish areas and Jews dominating the routes to and from Arab neighborhoods. In the countryside, Jewish and Arab settlements flanked most of the roads, enabled each side to interdict the other's traffic. This meant the Jewish settlers could cut off Arab villagers, and the villagers equally could cut off the besieged Jewish settlers. And three, the Civil War took place while Britain ruled the country and while its military forces were deployed in the various regions. The British's willingness and ability to intervene in the hostilities progressively diminished as their withdrawal progressed, and by the second half of April 1948, 
they rarely interfered, except to secure their withdrawal routes. Nonetheless, throughout the Civil War, the belligerents had to take account of the British presence and their possible reaction to any initiative. Down to mid-April, this presence seriously affected both Arab and Jewish war-making. Through the war, each side accused the British of favoring the other, but in fact, British policy, as emanating both from Whitehall and from Jerusalem, the seat of the High Commissioner, was one of strict impartiality, generally expressed in non-intervention in favor of either side while trying to maintain law and order until the end of the mandate. Both Whitehall and Jerusalem were eager to keep British casualties down, but at the same time, Whitehall was bent on quitting Palestine with as little loss to its power and prestige in the Middle East as possible. This implied a number of contradictions. The most important related to non-intervention versus the maintenance of law and order, maintaining law and order often necessitated intervention. Moreover, intervention almost inevitably led to British casualties, and this ran afoul of the desire and intent to avoid them. The military's guidelines were explicit. Our forces would take no action except such as was directed towards their own withdrawal, and the withdrawal of our stories, i.e., they would not be responsible for maintaining law and order, except as necessary for their own protection. But the High Commissioner, Alan Cunningham, was also interested in leaving behind him as orderly a country and reputation as he could, and this required the maintenance of law and order for as long as possible. His boss, Colonel Secretary Arthur Creech Jones, had told the House of Commons on the 3rd of December 1947 that the British government must remain responsible for law and order for as long as it administered Palestine. Cunningham put it this way, It is our intention to be as impartial as is humanly possible, but we wish to protect the law-abiding citizen. This meant that the British would try to protect those attacked. In practice, British troops intervened in the fighting quite frequently from November 1947 down to March 1948, and occasionally in April as well. This was one reason for the precipitous increase in British casualties during the mandate's last five months. Another was the attacks on British troops by LHI and IZL gunmen, usually triggered by Arab attacks on Jews in which Britons were known to have assisted. In all of 1947, British forces in Palestine suffered 60 dead and 189 wounded. In the period of the 1st of January to the 14th, May 1948, British losses were 114 dead and 230 wounded. The further contradiction between strict impartiality and a desire to maintain Britain's standing in the Middle East, which required a pro-Arab tilt, led to inconsistent behavior causing confusion among British officials and officials and um, among many Arabs and Jews. British military interventions down to mid-March 1948 tended to work the Yeshuv's advantage since during the war's first four months, the Arabs were generally on the offensive, and the Jews were usually on the defensive. British columns repeatedly intervened on the side of attack Jewish settlements and convoys, and the British regularly supplied escorts to Jewish convoys in troubled areas, such as the road to Jerusalem. This led to Arab accusations that the British were pro-Zionist. But, strategic, but strategically speaking, 
During this period, the massive British military presence and Haganah suspicions that the British, in fact, favored the Arabs, there is a sort of secret coalition between Azam, Pasha, and Bevin, said Ben-Gurion, tended to inhibit Haganah operations. The Haganah could not contemplate large-scale operations of which it became growingly capable as the war advanced, or conquest of Arab territory out of fear of British intervention, and it understandably shield away from fighting the British while its hands were full with the Palestinian Arab militias and their foreign auxiliaries, though to be sure the IZL and the LHI were far less cautious. Until April 1948, the Haganah operated under the assumption that the British military would block or forcefully roll back large-scale operations. To a lesser extent, however, the British presence also inhibited Palestinian Arab attacks at certain times. Moreover, the British military presence and continued sovereignty over the country certainly deterred the regular Arab armies from crossing the frontiers and interfering in the fighting before the 15th of May. The Arab leaders' periodic threats to this effect during the Civil War remained empty bluster. The guideline of impartiality authorized by British cabinet decision on the 4th of December 1947 translated during the following months into a policy of quietly assisting each side in the takeover of areas in which that side was demographically dominant. In practice, this meant the handover as the British successfully withdrew from each area. Tel Aviv in December 1947, Gaza in February 1948, and so on. Of mandate government installations, police forts, military camps, utilities, to the majority communities control. The police forts and camps in the hill country of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee generally were turned over to Arab militia commanders, installations in the coastal plain, and the Jordan and Jezreel valleys went to the Haganah. This policy sometimes occasioned a more radical expression, British advance or urging to specific threatened or defeated communities to evacuate. For example, on the 18th of April 1948, the British urged the Arab inhabitants of Tiberias to evacuate the town. A week later, they preferred the same advice in Balad Ash Sheikh, an Arab village southeast of Haifa. In the course of January through May 1948, the British periodically urged the small Jewish communities north of Jerusalem, Neve, Yaakov, and Atorat, to clear out as they did the inhabitants of the four kibbutzim of the Etzion block, south of Bethlehem. British troops did not always abide by the guideline of impartiality. Occasionally they indulged in overt anti-Jewish behavior, usually immediately following LHI or IZL attacks on them. During the war's first months, British troops occasionally confiscated arms from Haganah units protecting convoys or manning outposts in urban areas. The British argued that they also seized arms from Arab militiamen, and on a number of occasions British units disarmed Haganah men and handed them over to Arab mobs and justice. For example, on the 12th of February 1948, a British patrol disarmed a Haganah roadblock and arrested its members on Jerusalem's Shamul Hanavi Street. The four men were later released, unarmed, into the hands of an Arab mob, which lynched them and mutilated their bodies. A similar incident occurred a fortnight later, on the 28th of February, when British troops disarmed Haganah men at a position 
in a in the Heodzak factory near Holon. Eight men were butchered. The next day, LHI terrorists blew up a British troop train near Rahavat, killing 28 British troops and wounding dozens more. Moreover, Whitehall's fears that the circumstances of the withdrawal from Palestine might subvert Britain's standing in the Middle East occasioned a number of major organized British interventions against the Jewish militias, or non-interventions, in face of Arab attack. In the dying days of the mandate, see below for the cases of Jaffa and the Etzian bloc in April and May. The Relative Power of the Two Sides At the start of the Civil War, Whitehall believed that the Arabs would prevail. In the long run, the Jews would not be able to cope, and would be thrown out of Palestine unless they came to terms with the Arabs, was the considered judgment of the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, CIGS. And indeed, the battle between the Yushuv and the Arab community seemed at least on paper extremely unequal. The Palestinian Arabs enjoyed a rough 2 to 1 population advantage, 1.2 or 1.3 million to 630,000, and physically populated more of the country's surface than did the Jews. They also generally enjoyed the advantage of the high ground, whereas the Jews live principally in the lowlands. Moreover, they benefit, benefited from the vast hinterland of neighboring sympathetic states, which could supply them with volunteers, supplies, and safe havens. The Zionists' hinterland Jewish and Zionist groups in the diaspora lay hundreds and thousands of miles away, and supplies and volunteers to the embattled Yishuv had to penetrate the British naval and air blockades of Palestine. These factors aside, however, the Yishuv enjoyed basic advantages over the Palestine Arabs in major indexes of strength national organization and preparation for war, trained military manpower, weaponry, weapons production, economic power, moral and motivation, and above all, command and control. Moreover, despite the general demographic tilt, the Yishuv had a disproportionate number of army age males, 20 to 44 year olds, as during the 1930s and 1940s, the Zionist leadership had taken care as a matter of policy to ship to Palestine, legally and illegally, young fit males, deemed good pioneering material. Facing off in 1947-1948 were two different societies. One, highly motivated, literate, organized, semi-industrial, the other, backward, largely illiterate, disorganized, agricultural. For the average Palestinian Arab man, a villager, political independence, and nationhood were vague abstractions. His affinities and loyalties lay with his family, clan, and village, and occasionally region. Moreover, as we have noted, Palestinian Arab society was deeply divided along social and religious lines, and among the more literate and politically conscious, there was a deep, basic fissure going back to the 1920s between the Husseinis and the Nashibis. Nash Nashashibis. The 1936 to 1939 revolt had both 
irreparably deepened this divide. The rebellion ended with something like civil war between the two factions, and left Palestinian Arab society largely decapitated, politically and militarily. The years of the Husseini's anti-opposition terrorism, which continued into 1946 and 1947, had driven the Nas Hashibis and many of their allies out of political life altogether. Some <clears throat> Come 1948, they abstained from joining the fight against Zionism. At the, time, at the same time, the British wounded or in exile. A general weariness of armed struggle had set in. The rebellion had also devastated the Arabs economically, though the war years had seen the economy bounce back. But in general, Palestinian Arab society had failed to overcome the trauma of the rebellion years. During the mandate, the Arab community had periodically tried, but failed to develop self-governing institutions, and not because of British obstructionism. The community's sole veteran ex executive body was the Supreme Muslim Council, which dealt with religious affairs. The AHC dominated since its inception in 1936 by the Husseinis, was unelected and unrepresentative in its remodeled form during 1946 to 1948. It completely sidelined the opposition. Although it possessed a large network of supporters and agents in the localities and to some degree oversaw the workings of the local national committees, which were resurrected with the start of the hostilities, the AHC failed to establish working national government structures. The AHC theoretically functioned as a cabinet, with the exiled Hajj Amin al Husseini as president and Jamal Husseini as his deputy. Other committee members were responsible for particularly for particular areas of interest. Sheikh Hassan Abu Saud, the establishment of the national committees or localities, Rafiq Tamimi Jaffa, Muen al Mahdi Hafa. In nineteen forty six to 1947, the AHC had six departments, land, lands, finances, economics, national organization, prisoners, and casualties, and press, which according to the HIS made theoretical sense, but in truth, there was chaos. Andromusia, in most of them, at the end of 1947, the AHC sorry. At the end of 1947, the AHC restructured the departments to face the challenges of war and statehood. But according to the HIS, by early 1948, only the Finance Department, or Treasury, remained. The National Organization, Economic and Prisoners and Casualties Department, had merged to become the Emergency Committee, L Lajnat al Tawari, composed of Syed al Din Aref, a nephew of Aref al Aref, and Ghalib al Khalidi brother of Hussein, Fakhri El Khalidi, Jerusalem's mayor, and a member of the AHC. The functional hordes between the AHC, which theoretically managed the war on the national level, and the emergency committee were blurred. The HIS described the members and officials of the emergency committee as murderers, swords for hire, and thieves, <clears throat> 
but paradoxically rated the committee itself as efficient. However, the members all took part in the various activities, with no lines of demarcation between them. All buy weapons, all deal with supplies, all hand out military and civil instructions, and the confusion is great. By the start of the war, the AHC had signally failed. A major reason, as in 1936 to 1939, was its inability to raise funds. Palestine's Arabs were generally poor, and the wealthy, many of them identified with the opposition and disproportionately Christian, were reluctant to part with their money. The AHC's chief fundraising agency was the Treasury Department, headed by Izzat Tanous. But Tanous' crash effort, starting in June 1947 to assemble funds through taxation, one mil per packet of cigarettes, five mils per bus ticket, and voluntarily contributions from the more prosperous, was a dismal failure. The department was also tainted by corruption. By the 1st of November, it had managed to raise only 25,000 Palestinian pounds. The Palestinian leadership during the 1930s and 1940s may have talked often and loudly about independence, but it had done little in terms of nuts and bolts preparations for self-government. The reasons were historical, cultural, and sociological. The centuries of Ottoman rule had failed to install in the Ayan a tradition of public service. Rather, the wealthy vied for personal wealth, land, and power. Decades of cooperation with the Ottomans had rendered the Ayan corrupt and venal. Under the British, it appeared easier to rely on the mandatory institutions which functioned efficiently than to embark on the pioneering difficult task of creating their own. Few Arabs acquired governmental or military experience during the mandate, and a giant question mark hangs over the nationalist ethos of the Palestinian Arab elite, Husseinis as well as Nashakabis, Khalidis, Dajanis, and Tamimis, stupid fucking names, just before and during the mandate, sold land to the Zionist institutions and or served as Zionist agents and spies. In addition, during 1936 to 1947, the Palestinians developed a political and psychological reliance on the Arab states to pull their chestnuts out of the fire. The contrast with Zionist society is stark. No national collective was more self-reliant or motivated. The Holocaust, having conceivably, conceivably demonstrated that there was no depending for survival on anyone else, and having implanted the certainty that a giant massacre would as likely as not be the outcome of militia defeat in Palestine, by the late 1940s, the Yishuv was probably one of the most politically conscious, committed, and organized communities in the world. It was also highly homogeneous, close to 90% Ashkenazi and 90% secular. Only about 3% of the Yishuv was ultra-Orthodox and anti-Zionist. Hesitantly, during the Ottoman years and with increasing intensity during the beneficent mandate as Jewish numbers swelled, the Yishuv fashioned the infrastructure of a state within a state, or a state in embryo. By 1947, in addition to the Haganah, the Yishuv had a proto-government, the Jewish Agency for Palestine, with a cabinet, the GAE, a foreign ministry, the agents, the agency's political department, a treasury, the agency's financial department, 
and most other departments and agencies of government, including a well-functioning, autonomous school system, a taxation system, settlement and land reclamation agencies, and even a powerful trades union federation. The Histadrut, with its own health service and hospitals, sports organization, agricultural production, and marketing agencies, bank industrial plants, and daily newspaper, and publishing house. Unlike the Palestinian Arabs, the Yishuv had a highly talented, sophisticated public service oriented elite, experienced in diplomacy and economic and military affairs. Most of the 26 to 28,000 Palestinian Jews who had served in the Allied armies during World War II were or became Haganah members. The Yishuv also enjoyed the effective backing of the World Zionist Organization, which had powerful branches in the United States. The Zionist movement had grown by leaps and bounds and acquired popular support during and after World War II as a result of the Holocaust. At crucial junctures, the Zionists were able to tap the goodwill and political and financial resources of the large diaspora Jewish communities. In an emergency fundraising tour of the United States in January, March 1948, Golda Meyerson raised $50 million for the Haganah, twice the sum that Ben-Gurion had asked her to bring back. A brilliant success, in the words of Abba Hillel Silver, who praised her eloquence and persuasion. In a second whirlwind tour of American Jewish communities in May and June, she raised an other $50 million. These funds paid for the Czech arms shipments that proved decisive in the battles of April through October 1948. Theoretically, the Palestinians had the whole Arab world to fall back on, but that world, less organized, and less generous than the world jewelry, came that gave them little in their hour of need in money and arms. More robust was the contribution in terms of volunteers. But in this sphere, too, the pan-Arab contribution was actually meager in all its bluster. There appears to have been great reluctance to actually go and fight, especially among the more prosperous and educated. As one British intelligence official put it in December 1947, among the younger men, there is a great deal of temporary enthusiasm and exhibitionism, especially in Egypt, but very many of the youths who have so bravely smashed the windows of defenseless Jewish shopkeepers have little intention of undertaking anything so hazardous and uncomfortable as warfare in the stark Judean hills. Nonetheless, six to eight thousand volunteers reached Palestine mainly from Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, and served alongside the local Arab militia units in the towns with the Arab Liberation Army and in the Muslim Brotherhood contingents in the south. But although the call for jihad reverberated through the Arab world, the front-line states, essentially poor and badly organized, proved unable to accommodate or deploy many of the volunteers. Indeed, the thousands who poured into Egypt and British-ruled Tripolitania, Cyrenica, from the Maghreb, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia from early May were seen as restive and argumentative and vaguely a threat to the regimes, and most were incarcerated and then deported home. In mid-June, the Egyptians under British and 
French prodding, closed their borders to further Maghrebi volunteers. More successful in penetrating Palestine were the hundreds of Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood volunteers who entered the Gaza district in March, April 1948 and fought alongside local militiamen. They were superficially trained by the Egyptian army in camps in Marsa, Matra, and Hakstap. Several dozen Britons, most of them former British army or police officers, by mid-March 1948, some 230 British soldiers and 30 policemen had deserted. Also served in Palestinian Arab ranks, as did some volunteers from Yugoslavia and Germany. The Yugoslavs, possibly in their dozens, were both Christians, formerly members of pro-Axis fascist groups, and Bosnian Muslims. The handful of Germans were former Nazi intelligence, Wehrmacht and SS officers. The Yishuv was reinforced mostly after mid-May by more than 4,000 volunteers, Jewish and non-Jewish, from abroad. Most were idealists who supported the Zionist cause. A few came for the pay and adventure. Almost all had served in the Allied forces in World War II. A fair number were pilots and navigators, Air Force ground personnel, sailors, and experts in communications and armored war warfare. A large contingent of about 800 arrived from South Africa. Many came from North America. Of the IAFs, 193, 193 pilots in the 1948 war. 171 were foreign volunteers, about a hundred of them Americans. The case of Milton M. Rubenfeld, Captain U.S. AAF Reserve 0-940081, serial number, was not unusual. In early December 1947, he contacted the Jewish Agency writing. In 1939, I enlisted in the Royal Air Force, UK, and fought for England because I thought I was helping the cause of the Jews. I desire to do the same thing now. I could fly thousands of Jews into Palestine a month. He also suggested buying mothballed American fighter aircraft. If the U.S. government refuses permission to fly these aircraft to Palestine, I will do so anyway, he wrote. Much of the senior staff of the Haganah IDF 7th Armored Brigade, including its commanding officer, Ben Dunkelman, and two of his battalion commanders, Joe Weiner and Baruch Friedman Erez, were Anglo-Saxon volunteers. One American volunteer, David Mickey, Marcus of Eisenhower's staff, in World War II, briefly served as an advisor to Ben Gurion and on the IDF general staff with the rank of general before being accidentally killed by an Israeli sentry in June 1948. He is the only American soldier who died serving in a foreign army to be buried at West Point. About 20% of the IDF's medical corps at the end of the 1948, were foreign volunteers. The Yishuv entered the Civil War with one large militia and two very small parliamentary or terrorist organizations. The Haganah, the military arm of the mainstream Zionist parties, especially the socialist Mapai, and Mapam, with 35,000 members, and the IZL, the military arm of the revisionist movement and its youth movement, Betar, in the LHI, which was composed somewhat unnaturally of breakaways from the IZL and left-wing revolutionaries who regarded the British Empire as their chief enemy. 
The IZL had been two and three thousand members, and the LHI some three to five hundred. During the Civil War, the three organizations occasionally coordinated their operations and did not clash with one another. The Haganah, which as of the 1st of June 1948 was renamed the Israeli Defense Forces, was the organization that counted during the first months of the Civil War while defending the Jewish settlements and lines of communication, it reorganized. In a sense, the reorganization from an amateur, territorially based militia into a relatively professional army was carried out behind the shield provided by the Palma, the Haganah Strike Force. In November 1947, the Palma had 2,100 soldiers with a 1,000 reservists. During the following months, while battling the Palestinian Arabs and suffering severe losses, it expanded into a force of 6,000 troops subdivided into three brigades. Before the war, the Haganah fielded territorially based infantry companies in the Yishuv's towns and settlements. There was a skeletal general staff with specialized branches, intelligence services, manpower, logistics, medical corps, and so on, and an embryonic air service. The reorganization and expansion of November 1947 to May 1948 resulted in the creation and deployment of 12 brigades, three of them Palma and two armored. The Haganah's chief of operations, Yigil Yadin, had formulated the reorganization order on the 7th of November, 1947. Its preamble read, The danger of an attack on the country by the armies of the neighboring states necessitates a different structure and deployment. Opposite regular armies, there is a need to deploy with a trained regular military force armed and built along regular military lines. The seeds of the transformation were planted already in December 1946, when Ben-Gurion, the GAE's chairman, effectively the Yishuv's prime minister, took over the agency's defense portfolio. During the following months, he studied the Yishuv's defense needs. Unlike others in the Zionist leadership, Ben-Gurion understood early on that the decisive battle for Jewish statehood would be waged not against the British or in the international arena, but on the ground against the Arabs inside Palestine and along its borders. He realized that the Palestinian Arabs would not constitute a major military threat, but he feared the armies of the Arab states, as he told the 22nd Zionist Congress. Until recently, there was only the problem of how to defend the Yishuv against the Palestinian Arabs. But now we faced a completely new situation. The land of Israel is surrounded by independent Arab states that have the right to purchase and produce arms, to set up armies and train them. Attack by the Palestinian Arabs does not endanger the Yishuv, but there is a danger that the neighboring Arab the neighboring Arab states will send their armies to attack and destroy the Yishuv. The Yishuv's military capabilities improved significantly during the immediate post-war years. One element was the establishment of a clandestine arms industry. The plants were usually built under cow sheds and other agricultural installations. The industry was based on machine tools, purchased in the United States by Haganah representatives in 1944 to 1946. By the, end of the 1940, by the end of 1947, the Haganah arms factories were producing two and three inch mortars, Sten machine guns, and grenades and bullets in large numbers. Their contribution was not insignificant. Between the 1st of October 1947 and the 31st, of May 
1948, the secret plants produced 15,468 Sten guns, more than 200,000 grenades, 125 three inch mortars with more than 130,000 rounds, and some 40 million 9mm Sten gun bullets. Another element was planning. Before 1946, the Haganah General Staff, HGS, had prepared plans for resisting a renewed Arab rebellion, with the Haganah seen as an auxiliary to the British military. In May 1946, the HGS formulated Toknik Gimel, Plan C for the May Plan, addressing the possibility of mass organized Arab attacks on the Yishuv. The plan included guidelines for Haganah retaliation against Arab leaders, villages, and urban districts. Agenda Adena from October and December 1946 related to possible British assistance to the Arabs. In doctrinal terms, the Haganah from this point on took on sole responsibility for the defense of the Yishuv. During the countdown to 1948, a behind-the-scenes struggle for dominance in the reorganizing defense apparatus raged between the veteran Haganah commanders and the regular allied, mostly British, army veterans who had returned from Europe. Ben-Gurion preferred the army veterans arguing that the impending war would be mainly conventional war, while the Haganah brass had trained for a guerrilla struggle against irregulars. But the incumbent Haganah commanders effectively resisted the old man, and although some former British army officers received important commands, such as the brigadiers Chaim Laskov and Shlomo Shamir, the HGS and the brigade and battalion headquarters were manned predominantly by Haganah veterans with Palma officers. Yiga Alan, Yitzhak Rabin, Yitzhak Sada, and Shimon Avedan figuring prominently. At the end of the November 1947, the Haganah's Armory consisted of 10,662 rifles, 3,830 pistols, 3,662 submachine guns, 775 light machine guns, 157 medium machine guns, 16 anti-tank guns, 672-inch mortars, and 84 3-inch mortars. Much of the weaponry was dispersed among the settlements, where it was needed for self-defense. In addition, the Jewish Settlement Police, officially under British command, but in fact loyal to the Haganah, had some 6,800 rifles and 48 machine guns. Most Jewish settlements entered the war with well-prepared trench works, bunkers, and bomb-proof shelters. With barbed wire, perimeter fences, and lighting, and minefields. The 250-odd rural settlements doubled as small fortified encampments, but the Haganah had no artillery or tanks, used makeshift armored cars, essentially trucks with steel plating, and had no combat aircraft, only light spotter planes, Ammunition was in short supply, some 50 rounds per rifle, and six to 700 rounds per machine gun. The IZL and LHI together had another thousand or so light arms. The Palestinian Arabs had nothing comparable to the Haganah. During its brief existence, the Palestinian national movement failed to establish a national militia, but not for want of trying. On paper, the Palestinian Arabs in 1946 to 1947 had two parliamentary youth organizations, the Najada and the Futawa. Their chief activity 
consisted of noisy parades in town squares. Little, if any, military training took place. The Najata was founded in Jaffa in November, December 1945 by Muhammad Nimr al Hawari, a Nazareth born lawyer of Bedouin origin, who had served in the Mandate administration and had broken with the Hussainis in the early 1940s. Its founding proclamation declared that the Zionist movement was the most heinous crime known to history and defined the organization's aims as installing national consciousness and discipline in Palestine's youth. al Hawarte tried to model the Najada on the Haganah. By mid-1946, it had, on paper, 8,000 members. The Futawa was founded at the end of 1935 by Jamal Husseini as the Arab Party's youth chorus. The Nazi Party, or the Hitler Jugend, appear to have been his model. It was disbanded during the Arab Revolt and resurrected by Husseini in early 1946 as a counterweight to the Najada. Kamil Arakat, a retired Mandate police officer, was its commander. The two organizations vied for recruits. The Husseinis then tried to take over the Najada. Hawari resisted, but fearing assassination, fled to Jordan at the end of 1947. By the start of the war, neither the Futawa nor the Najada in effect existed. The Palestinians entered the war without a national military organization. Rather, the Arabs followed the pattern set at the start of the 1936 revolt. A number of large organized armed bands, which the Jews called gangs, sprang up in December 1947 in more or less spontaneous fashion. As in 1936 to 1939, they were most active in the hill country of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, and consisted largely of local peasants. The most important bands were Abd al Qadar al Husseinis, al Jihad al Muqaddas, which operated in the hills around Jerusalem. Hassan Salami's group, based in the villages around Lida and the Judean foothills to the east, and the band led by Abu Ibrahim al Shighur in Lower Galilee. Each band had a hard core of two to five hundred fighters who moved about the countryside, quartering in successive villages. Some villages refused to host them for fear of Jewish retribu retribution. The bands were lightly armed, their heaviest weapons running to two and three inch mortars and medium machine guns. Each band was able to call on varying members of local volunteers for short, specific engagements. The Haganah's opinion of the band's abilities was low, as was Al Kawaji's. He reportedly described them as unreliable, excitable, and difficult to control, and in organized warfare, virtually unemployable. The bands, in fact, often fought with tenacity and skill, but they rarely cooperated with one another, and tended, by high-handed and often brutal behavior, to alienate the villagers among whom they swam. In Mao Zedong's phrase, from the first the bands the encountered great reluctance from the villagers to volunteer or help, and occasionally villages refused them entry. The unwillingness to join in the hostilities out of fear was occasionally matched by secret specific ceasefire agreements between Arab villages and neighboring Jewish settlements. This led one historian to conclude that Palestinian society during this period did not have that national spirit which Benedict Anderson said constituted a fraternity that makes it possible. For so many millions of people 
not so much to kill as willingly to die. One can conclude that Arab nationalism in Palestine was expressed in the existence of national consciousness and national emotions, but without the readiness to act or sacrifice. The largest and best organized Arab formation fighting in Palestine until the pan-Arab invasion of May 1948 was the ALA, consisting mainly of volunteers from Syria, Iraq, and Palestine, mustered by the Arab League in Syria. The volunteers were trained in Syrian army camps in Qatana near Damascus, beginning in November 1947, and the ALA was officially established on the 1st of January 1948, with Fazi al-Kawaji at its head. Al-Kawaji told his volunteers that they were going off to jihad to help the persecuted Arabs of Palestine. We must expel the Jews from the Arab part of Palestine and limit them in the small area where they live and they must remain under our supervision and guard. Our war is holy. Women, children, and prisoners must not be harmed. Syria initially supplied the money and arms, but during the following months, the other Arab states contributed to the ALA's upkeep. At its height, in April and October 1948, the ALA had four to five thousand troops and could call on the services of hundreds of local volunteers in its areas of operation. The bulk of the army's officers were retired or seconded Syrian and Iraqi army personnel, with a sprinkling of Jordanians, Lebanese, Egyptians, and Bosnians. Company and battalion-sized ALA formations entered Palestine from Lebanon and Jordan starting in December 1947 to January 1948 and fanned out in the mixed towns to bolster local Palestinian militia contingents and in the hill country of Samaria and Judea. They were equipped with a diverse collection of light weapons, light and medium-sized mortars, and a number of 75mm and 105mm guns with a small stock of shells. In mid-May, with the invasion of Palestine by the regular Arab armies, the ALA withdrew to Qatana to reorganize. During the following weeks, the army returned to Palestine, this time to the Galilee, now armed with additional mortars and field pieces, and a handful of antiquated armored cars. On paper, in October 1948, the ALA consisted of eight battalions, Yarmouk the first, Yarmouk the second, Yarmouk three, Ajnadin, Husayn, Cadiz Ia, Hitin, and Druze battalion. But in reality, it mustered no more than three to four, more or less, regular-sized battalions. The three Yarmouk battalions, and possibly the Hitton battalion. The other battalions were, in effect, company-sized units that for 15... for... that... Hmm. excuse me. The other battalions were, in effect, company-sized units that, before the 15th of May, were posted in towns to reinforce local militias. Though nominally part of an army, each ALA battalion usually operated on its own. The ALA was crushed and finally ejected from Palestine at the end of October. In the main, Palestinian Arab military power was based on the separate local militias in the country's seven to eight hundred Arab villages and towns. Of these, only some four hundred were involved in the war. The remainder, almost all in the territory that became the West Bank, were untouched by hostilities and barely contributed to the war effort. Each village had its own militia of ten or fifty or a hundred able-bodied men 
with pistols or rifles, and a small stock of ammunition. The weapons were of diverse makes, and ages sometimes obsolete. Usually, each village militia was on its own. There was no national framework. At best, neighboring villages might help each other. Occasionally, the militias of a cluster of villages would mount a joint attack, usually as appendages of an armed band or an ALA unit on a Jewish convoy or settlement. The firefight over the militiamen would disperse to their homes until the next faza, or summons. The faza might last a few hours, or a day, or two. In defense, each village was almost always on its own. When the Haganah went on the offensive, it was able to pick the villages off, one at a time. Many villages tried to stay out of the fray, and some even preferred to assist the Jews out of a deep-seated antagonism toward their neighbors, or because they believed that the Jews would win. By the beginning of summer 1948, the Druze villages of the Carmel and Western Galilee had thrown in their lot with the Jews. A few weeks later, the IDF set up a Druze unit which participated in its offensives. All the Palestinian forces, armed bands, ALA, and village militias suffered from acute supply problems. Especially badly off were the villages. In terms of food, they were largely Atershik. A U T A R C H I C. But they needed guns, ammunition, fuel. Yet most received no outside supplies of any kind during the war. And ALA and the bands had no supplies to spare. And when the Arab states or the Arab League Military Committee sent arms and ammunition, they almost invariably ended up in the hands of the bands of the ALA. Some arms reached the larger urban militias. Through the Civil War, the villages sent purchasing missions to nearby towns or to Arab states to acquire a machine gun or a few rifles. But it was all a drop in the bucket. The ALA, the bands, and the urban militias replied on supplies, relied on supplies from neighboring Arab countries. But these states were poor, corrupt, badly organized, and not particularly generous, and the military committee, which supervised the war effort, and the AHC leaders in exile, proved unable to rise, raise the necessary funds or to organize the dispatch of war material to those in need. Haganah IDF intelligence files are littered with intercepted messages from Palestinian towns and villages from the bands and from ALA units desperately calling upon this or that state, the military committee, or the AHC to rush supplies. Almost invariably, the response was, soon, God willing. According to one report, by the 23rd of March, 1948, the Arab states had sent 9,800 rifles and almost 4 million rounds of ammunition to Palestine. But the bulk of the weaponry reached the ALA. A small part was distributed among the urban militias, and the bands, the villages, got nothing for almost nothing. Much of the weaponry in or reaching Palestine between November 1947 and 14th of May 1948 was of different types and calibers and many of the rifles were unusable. Particularly decrepit were the Saudi contributions. Only the ALA enjoined, enjoyed the benefit of fairly standardized weaponry and ammunition. The armed shipments, which were illegal 
had to get around British patrols and check posts. Moreover, the Haganah, well informed, occasionally interdicted arms convoys. Interdicted. <laughs> Never heard of that one. As happened to a large shipment from Beirut heading for Haifa near Kirat Motskin on the 17th of March. I'm sorry, does he mean intercepted? Arms convoys. Anyway, why question? A dozen Arabs were killed, including Haifa's militia commander, the Jordanian Mohammed bin Hamad al Huneti, and most of the arms and ammunition were destroyed. More critical than the supply problem was that of command and control. There were simply too many diverse Arab units and too many bodies pulling the strings from outside. There were the ALA units, some of them semi-independently garrisoning towns, the armed bands, and the individual village militias. The larger towns each had a number of militias. Jaffa had three or four, owing allegiance to different political controllers. The local national committee, the AHC, a nearby armed band, the ALA, the military committee in Damascus, or even specific Arab governments. The Jordanians, for example, sent a number of large Bedouin volunteer contingents that were directly controlled by a man. The Muslim Brotherhood contingents were loosely managed from Cairo. The nominal coordinator of this departure, war effort, the military committee, beyond loosely controlling the ALA, al Kawaji, was never particularly obedient, proved incapable of coordinating the different military groups. Indeed, the committee itself spent much of its time fending off challenges from the AHC, which sought out to supplant it in the direction of the war. Inside Palestine, the ALA and most of the local national committees rebuffed AHC efforts at intrusion or control, fearing that AHC directives could embroil them in unwanted or premature hostilities with the British or the Jews. Aware of the problem, the military committee, ALA leaders, Haj Amin al Husseini, and Palestinian band leaders met in Damascus under the chairmanship of Syrian President Shukri al Kwawatli on the 5th of February 1948 to sort out the mess. A plan providing for cooperation and a division of Palestine into zones of responsibility, was hammered out. Galilee and Samaria were placed under al Kawaji, ALA, the Jerusalem district, under Abdi al Qadar al Husseini, the Lida area under Salami, and the South under the Egyptian commander. The military committee was nominally given overall charge and the Mufti was effectively sidelined. But the problem of the rival militias, especially in the big towns, and the rival interest of the patron Arab states, was left unresolved. And the death of Abdi el Qadar in early April left the crucial Jerusalem area bereft of central command for the crucial remaining five weeks of the Civil War. In effect, through February until the 14th of May, the various bands and militias and the ALA fought separately and without real coordination. This was probably the most important factor in the eventual Palestinian defeat and in the Haganah's relative ease in accomplishing it.